everybody, Amy Williams here with Skellig. And in this video, I'm gonna introduce the architecture used in our Greenfield Life Science UNS demo. I do wanna preface this. The approach outlined in this demo is not the end all be all. The great news is there are like a million ways to build a successful architecture. The beauty about being open, not trapped in vendor lockdowns means you can mix and match different solutions to pick the best ones for whatever your specific need is. But that does raise the question, if there are a million possibilities, how do I pick the ones for today? That goes back to Skelly's mission. We are trying to help specifically life sciences, but as many people as possible within the industry. So that means two things. First, we pick solutions that can withstand the very strict FDA regulations. And second, we kept it simple. A UNS architecture, it should span across multiple sites in your enterprise, and it should use all those really cool cloud technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning. We intentionally didn't include any of that here because honestly, most of us in life sciences aren't ready for it. Instead, this demo is focused on building that foundation. We are starting small with connecting one piece of equipment at one site. Because if you can nail that first step when building a new facility, you have set yourself up to be successful when you scale out and add functionality. All right, with that said, let's get into our use case and how we're gonna solve it. We are a greenfield facility that's gonna be using a single use bioreactor. And since it's life sciences, we're gonna be running batches. The old way of going about it might have looked something like this, and we know that is no good. As a quick recap, this architecture relied on those discrete connections shown by the blue arrows. So basically one system only sees the data that it is directly connected to. And those connections are so expensive, so time consuming that a lot of data ends up getting siloed and left behind. But of course, you still end up needing that data. So you have to do a lot of emails or have daily scrum meetings just for status updates. I kid you not, I was at a site a few years ago where when they were starting up, the status of everything was done by physical sticky notes on a whiteboard. And then once they were running, they evolved into using an uh, Excel sheet that got updated in daily scrum meetings, which is always going to be perpetually outdated. So this site wants to avoid all of that. And to do that, we're going to use a unified namespace architecture. And here is our software stack. The first thing that I want you to notice is we are using MQTT as our main message protocol to transmit data. And again, we're doing that to alleviate the need for all of those discrete connections. In this demo, we specifically chose that we wanted HiveMQ to be our enterprise broker. Something cool about Hive is they actually use clustering. Rather than have just one MQTT broker, one single point of failure, instead what they do is they have a distributed system of nodes that acts like a single broker to any client. What's great is you can install those nodes on completely separate physical or virtual machines. Talk about redundancy and resilience. If one node goes down, no worries. As long as the other node is still up, your broker is still good to go. And they can do that on-prem or in the cloud. And that's fantastic because that ensures you get that 100% uptime for your broker. And another cool thing about Hive is they actually created an enterprise security extension for their broker. That lets you use different sources for external authentication, individualized topic permissions on a per client basis, and gives you detailed access logs. Basically, the extension gives you a lot of tools to ensure your security and compliance, which is why it was picked for our Greenfield facility. The other thing that I want you to notice is in the middle, right next to HiveMQ, we have Ignition. I wanna talk about Ignition for a sec. 10 years ago, when you heard of Ignition, you might've thought, oh, that's a SCADA system. That is not an accurate description of what it is today. It really has evolved into being an industrial platform you can use to solve so many use cases. If you've never heard of Ignition before, this is what you need to know. The basic Ignition platform has a bunch of drivers that can connect to all sorts of equipment. They got stuff for like Rockwell, Siemens, OPC, MQTT, just to name a few. Then, it has a tag engine that can read the data from all that equipment and model it for you as you define in things called user-defined types, AKA a UDT. Now, Ignition can do more than that. It has visualizations, reporting, remote notifications, honestly, a whole lot of stuff. 
And if you want it, all you need to do is buy a module for that functionality. I want to circle back to the UDT part, because when you're talking about building a UNS, it is the structured data and events of your business. That's imperative. The reason Ignition is in the middle is because we are using a lot of its UDTs, a lot of its functionality to get the data from all the different nodes organized as they join into our unified namespace. We just covered the middle of the diagram. Let's start going around the circle and specifically let's start with the plant floor. For our new facility, the first piece of equipment that we're gonna get is one bioreactor. And that needs to be controlled somehow. And so to do that, we're gonna go the PLC route with an Opto 22's Brew Epic. You might be saying, hold up, don't we love DCS? Because that's the only way that gets us standardization on the plant floor. Won't a bunch of PLCs cause inconsistencies and chaos? No, that's why Groove Epics are amazing. Because right there on the Epic itself, it runs Ignition Edge and Codasys. So with Ignition, we're going to be able to model and standardize our Edge device before publishing that out into our UNS. And a Groove can support analog, digital, serial, basically whatever IO you have going in. And then once it's in the Groove, it can actually natively transmit that out over MQTT. The other thing I mentioned is we're using Codasys for the plant floor control. For those who don't know, Codasys is a completely open PLC programming language. It gives you all five of the IEC 611313 languages for free, which is structured text, function block diagram, ladder logic, sequential function charts, and instruction lists. And the really cool thing about Codasys is if you want to start programming with it, just go to the store and download the development system for free. They also have pre-built libraries available for purchase if you want to get a little fancier. What's great about Codasys is it's about as hardware independent as you can get. Big names like ABB, Advantech, Opto, Wago all make Codasys compatible devices. And to that point, Codasys even has something called a soft PLC license, which means that instead of needing a crazy expensive PLC, you can run Codasys on an industrial PC even something as cheap as a Raspberry Pi. We purposely chose Codasys for this demo because we are thrilled about what they are doing. This is their year. There are two big announcements coming up that you should be excited about. First, there is a very robust DCS library created by IO Automation that's going to be available for purchase sometime this year on their store. And second, the Codasys store is actively rolling out container-based licensing. As of filming this video, not everything is up yet, but when it is, I am definitely going to make another video or announcement because I think the impact for Plan 4 Control is going to be phenomenal. So keep an eye out for that. Circling back, Codasys is really just focusing on that Plant 4 phase control, but this is a plan. We're gonna have multiple pieces of equipment and we're gonna need some kind of coordinating overview later, in which case we're gonna go with a SCADA system. And for that SCADA, we're going to pick Ignition. As I mentioned earlier, the nice thing about Ignition is you can pick and choose the functionality that you need. For us to do SCADA, that just means we tack on a few more modules, like maybe perspective and remote notifications. So to recap, we have our plant floor IO, which can be like analog, digital, serial, whatever, plugged into our Groove Epic, where Codasys is going to be running and controlling our phase logic. Then all that interesting data is going to get modeled thanks to Ignition Edge, and then it's going to be transmitted out over MQTT to be visible in our UNS. So the next guy in our diagram is the historian, where we have picked Canary. Canary is really cool for two big things. First, it has a super fancy data compression technology, which means it is way more efficient at storing data than the big name historian we are all too familiar with. That's awesome for you, because that makes it crazy affordable. In 2024, it's 126K for unlimited. That means like unlimited views, events, all the functionality you're used to with your traditional historian. And it's important to note, the accessible price point isn't because it does less. Rather, it is just that much more efficient at being a historian. The second reason we like Canary is it supports Sparkplug B. I didn't mention it yet in the series, so we'll do like five second overview. Sparkplug B is a specification for MQTT. It came after MQTT started being implemented widespread for SCADA. 
the spec created some standardizations on the topics and the payload structure to improve interoperability. And the other thing is Sparkplug enforces statefulness, which was optional in the classic MQTT spec. I mention that because Canary supports subscribing to Sparkplug B topics, as in, it can just start historizing your MQTT tags right away. So think about scalability. If I have to add 10 more reactors, am I gonna have to sit there and start mapping those 10 reactors by hand into my historian? No, I'm gonna go grab some coffee because Canary is just gonna subscribe to that topic and start historizing things as they become online. It's also worth mentioning too, that the Opto 22s paired with Ignition and a Sirius Link MQTT broker with Canary is the combo used in the 2023 Firebrand award-winning Life Science UNS project led by Josh Glass. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the batch engine. And in our demo, we're gonna be using the Cephasoft batch engine module. For those who don't know, Cephasoft is a company that makes additional functionality as extensions of Ignition. It makes more of those modules. And in this case, we're picking just one of their modules, which is the batch. There are a few reasons we like it. First, the module adheres very closely to ISA 88. It supports digital batch records, electronic signatures, basically all the stuff we're used to expecting with a batch. However, unlike traditional batch engines, it is open and that gives you flexibility. As long as your equipment can connect into Ignition, this batch engine will treat it all the same. If you really wanted, you could use a combination of Groove Epics, Rockwell, Siemens, all within one recipe. And the second great thing about openness is it allows that batch data to be exposed and freely published into my UNS over MQTT to build that full context. Next thing that we're gonna talk about is the data analytics, where we're gonna be using Flow software. What's really cool is Flow can subscribe to data from the broker, but it can also connect directly into many other sources of historical data, such as Canary, SQL, OPC, UA, DA, et cetera. And once it reads that data, it can do calculations for key process indicators, KPIs, even give you predictive analysis, remote notifications, and provides a web page based visualization to display all of that computation it did for you. And of course, icing on the cake, it will gladly share all of that data, all that modeling back into my UNS over MQTT. The reason I personally like Flow is it allows you to make models for your calculations so they scale. And then when you're actually using the software, it's low code. It's basically just a lot of dragging and dropping, very easy. So stuff that normally would be really frustrating and time consuming can take like five seconds. Here's a quick example. There are many softwares where I could easily get the average temperature over the past hour. However, many of those softwares fail at scaling and at handling more complicated intervals. Let's say I wanna take the average, not just for the hour, but maybe the day, or the week, or the month, or by operator shift A, or by batch, or just when pump Z is running. I wouldn't wanna attempt any of those calculations by hand in other softwares, because they would rely on me being like some kind of SQL superhuman. Versus with flow, I don't have to think twice about it. It's literally drag and drop to apply whatever interval or event I can dream up. That's why we're picking it for our data analysis and our Greenfield plan. Another thing though, because Flow deals with historical data and it actually provides some of that historical calculation modeling, I actually see a huge use case for it for legacy facilities, especially those guys who have Delta V. If you guys think that is something valuable and you wanna see a demo for it, let me know and, and comment below. The next notch is our ERP. Now you'll notice there is no software listed here and that was intentional. This demo is to show an example of how to start and it is not at the ERP layer. Again, you really should start from the plant floor and work your way up. However, I did wanna illustrate the concept of building context from all nodes in your system. So we're gonna simulate getting the lot number from our ERP in the demo. If this Greenfield facility eventually did wanna to connect to an ERP like SAP, they would probably use a Cephasoft connector for it. The next thing in our overview is the lab equipment. Remember in our poor 3.0 land, that lab data was really just a data silo. It might've had a LIN system, but those are usually pretty locked down. If you want to access data in there, you're going to need a direct login. 
yeah, maybe you can share it. But usually that involves exporting like a PDF that has to be manually emailed to somebody. No good. Scout Lake actually realizes this is a big problem. We run into this a lot. So something that we've developed is this lab digitization effort where we had a bunch of data drivers to connect to legacy or weird lab equipment. I listed some of the things we run into and had to develop drivers for below. We have OPC, SQL, MQTT, Modbus, Serial, Flat Files, Ethernet, Fieldbus, Profibus, and the list goes on. The point is, even if the market today isn't giving you options for open lab equipment, don't give up. It is possible to integrate that into a UNS. You might just need to get some kind of custom driver for it though. In the demo, we're gonna show that you can take a lab sample from some kind of traditionally closed cell viability analyzer, and then right there at the edge, we're gonna model it, contextualize it, and publish it into the UNS where then anybody can access that data. All right, and then the last thing over here we have is MES. Tulip is grayed out intentionally. It will not be shown in this demo. Instead, it's been moved over to the virtual plant, where again, if you want access, just go ahead and sign up on our website. It's a similar reason as the ERP. When you're just starting out at a new facility, step one should not be MES. You can't have digital work instructions if you don't even know your process yet. But I kept it listed here because I wanted to talk about MES a little bit and introduce Tulip. Again, Tulip is a new technology that I think most in pharma aren't even aware of. Tulip is not like your traditional 3.0 MES. And honestly, I don't even think I want traditional 3.0 MES. Tell me a time where MES has gone perfectly smoothly in a 3.0 facility. Anyone? No. It always seems to be complicated and go over budget. And I think a lot of the reason comes down to the fact that traditional 3.0 MES was the only one who could talk to both your ERP system and your control layer system. It had to do a lot of heavy lifting. There was a lot of scope, a lot of responsibility, a lot of regulatory needs to be met just for that one software layer. In my 4.0 facility, I want my data to be accessible to everyone. So I don't need or want an MES to do all that functionality. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm still going to have the functionality, but why not split it across different softwares who can excel at the need? For example, if I want to calculate something like OEE, I don't need Tulip necessarily to do that. Instead, maybe I use something that's really good at data analysis like Flow. Tulip, on the other hand, is more of a blank canvas where you can build apps for whatever your need is. And where Skellig sees it as being super helpful is in coordinating those manual work instructions and providing paper on glass solutions for your operators. All right, so that wraps up the overview of our demo. Stay tuned in the next and last video of the series, we are gonna be showing all of this in action. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope to see you soon.